the star is born, prophecy fulfilled. Um, and today, what I want to talk to you about today is the great light, the great light. And what I hope to, to really be able to pull from this is, is that this season, as, as we look around and we see Christmas trees and Christmas lights and Christmas lights on houses, we went last night, my family and I, we, we went out and we looked at Christmas lights. What I really hope that you start to pull from this is that the light, the great light, is Jesus Christ. It is a person. He is our hope. He's our faith. He's everything that we need. He is, of course, what we say this time of year. He's the reason for the season, of course. But he's the reason all year round. And we need him. We need him in our light or our lives. We need his light to shine in us. So I hope that you will really enjoy this message today titled The Great Light. We're going to look at three different prophecies. Okay, so three different prophecies about this from Isaiah, from Zechariah, and then from a guy named Simeon. Um, so three different, I would say, angles of this on, on how this, this really was prophetically seen, how Christ was prophetically seen as the great light. And then I want to show you from the book of Matthew how that prophecy was fulfilled in Jesus' life and ministry here on earth. And now I want to apply that to our lives. I want to really, really kind of just, we'll, we'll drill down into this and apply it to our lives today so that we can walk away from here with a really, I hope, a refreshed understanding of the great light, Jesus Christ, the light in our life. So Isaiah chapter 9 in the Bibles, Isaiah chapter 9, last week we were in Isaiah chapter 9, we, we started in verse 6, but this week we're going to start in verse number 1. I want to pull the first two verses out of this chapter, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, and, and show you kind of the beginning of this prophetic statement that um, God spoke through Isaiah. So let's pray before we begin. Father God, thank you so much, um, and we, we say this routinely and consistently here. Thank you for time that we can stop in, in the busyness of everything, in the busyness of, of especially this season. Everything going on socially and politically, we look at things around us and there's, like we, we discussed last week, there's such plight. God, there's so many distractions. There's such heaviness still. But we can take time to pause and we can remember what you, God, did for us. Not because we somehow loved you enough to earn your affection, but God, you loved us before we even looked to you. And you loved us in such an actionable way. You sent your son, our Savior, Jesus. So, so we just pause for a minute and we just say thank you. Thank you that you sent the light of this world into this world to dwell among us. Thank you that we can pause and, and reflect on this from your word. God, would you just lead us and guide us into all truth this morning as we look into your word, as we read your word, as we reflect. And Father, just bless our time as, as we always ask you. Keep us respectful and humble as we approach your word. Your complete and perfect, inerrant, sufficient word. God, help us to approach your word respectfully. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 1 and 2 here. It says, Nevertheless, the gloom of the distressed land will not be like that of the former times when he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. So that in the future he will bring honor to the way of the sea, to the land of the east of the Jordan, and, and to Galilee of the nations. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Underline that in your Bible. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. So this region that is talking about here, this Zebulun and Naphtali region, just west of the Sea of Galilee, um, this Galilean region, as as it was known in the in in the days of Jesus, as he was doing ministry on earth, this place. 
this was where the northern kingdoms of Israel were located. So you had King Solomon, and after his death, his sons took over. One of his sons took the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom split. So there's two, there's two tribes in the southern kingdom, known as the kingdom of Judah. And then there's ten tribes in the northern kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel. And they split over, of, of all things, taxes. There were some arguments over taxes. Um, Solomon's son, who took the throne, said, no, we're going to impose taxes. We're actually going to make it worse, which caused them to turn to, um, and, and I hope I'm getting my names right, Rehoboam and Jeroboam. So Rehoboam would have been the northern king, and Jeroboam, they would have turned to him and said, hey, take, take us, no, the north. He would have gone to the north. So take us up to the north and let's have this, you know, land of free, free of taxation, all these things. And what he recognized quickly was they, they took the capital, Jerusalem, in the southern kingdom of Judah. They, they remained, or the, Jerusalem remained the capital city. So they had to make pilgrimages back to Jerusalem. And what the king of the north recognized right away, man, if you go back, if, if the Jewish people go back to, the, to Jerusalem, they're going to be able to worship God. They're going to repent of their sins. They're going to turn from their wicked way. They're going to come under the authority of the southern king, and they're going to turn their hearts back to God. And he, the northern king, is going to lose his kingdom. So he said, no, we're, we're not going to do that. So he actually set up a border. Um, he prevented them from going back. And they began to worship all kinds of gods. It just became evil and corrupt. Well, over time, the Assyrians uh, invaded. That's what Isaiah is about. The Assyrian invasion of that northern kingdom. God used the Assyrians to basically wipe out and dismantle the northern kingdom. The ten tribes of the northern kingdom, they're lost to this day, gone. Okay, so they're all wiped out. And then the southern kingdom, that's, that's who God is dealing with in this. But the, the land of Zebulun, the land of Neph Nephtali, were, were part of that northern kingdom. So nevertheless, it says in verse 1, the gloom of this distressed land will not be like that of the former times when he humbled this land. But in the future, and he's speaking of, of this prophetically, in the future... He will bring honor to the way of the sea, this area, the land east of the Jordan, and to the Galilee of the nations. The people walking in darkness there in that region, and in all regions, will be shown and will see a great light. It says a light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. That land is known as the land of darkness. So turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. So this again, the great light, this is from the 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 prophetic viewpoint of Isaiah. But turn over, over in your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, and we'll start in verse 67. And this is from the perspective of Zechariah. So Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, him and Elizabeth have John the Baptist. Um, he's, he's coming out of this time when, when God muted him. God took away his ability to speak because of his really disbelief in what was happening. And this is right after they name, they're going to name their son John, and the people there are saying, hey, bring, bring the father in, bring Zechariah over here. You, know, you need to pencil in what we're going to name him. I thought, there's nobody named John. Why are we going to name him John? should be a family name, and he pencils it in, it's going to be John, and then his, his mouth is loosed, and he speaks, and he begins this prophetic statement in verse 67, then his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he prophesied, so here we go, blessed is the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and provided redemption for his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Just as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets in ancient times, so going all the way back to Isaiah, talking about this great light that would dawn for this land of, of the valley of the shadow of death, this, this place where darkness consumed, he's saying all the way back in ancient times they spoke about this word of salvation. Verse 71, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of those who hate us. He has dealt mercifully with our ancestors and remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant that we, 
having been rescued from the hand of our enemies, would serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness in his presence all our days. And you, child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. I can just picture you know, Zechariah holding his son, John the Baptist, this prophet who would go before Christ, who would prepare his way, prophetically spoken about. And you, child, he says in verse 76, will be called a prophet of the Most High. You will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of our God's merciful compassion, the dawn from on high will visit us, that dawning great light. And what will he do, verse 79, to shine on those who live in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. In verse 80, this child grew up and he became strong in the spirit and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. So right here we have another prophetic um, just proclamation of what the great light is. He's the horn of salvation to this people shining on this land of the shadow of death, a dawning of this light. And, and Zechariah, I mean, he knows, he's, he's, he's lifting up his child, John the Baptist, and he's saying, you, son, are going to go before the Lord. You're going to prepare his way. This light is coming. This great light is coming. And you get to prepare his way. There's another uh, look at this. Luke chapter 2, just one page over. Luke chapter 2, verse 25. And this is uh, Simeon's prophetic praise. So Mary comes to the the temple here and she's finished her days of purification now she's offering she's offering what the law required her to offer the sacrifice to 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 present their firstborn son as a dedication to the lord so they're fulfilling what was written in the law if you read above that but verse 25 there was a man in jerusalem whose name was simeon this man was righteous and devout looking forward to israel's consolation and the holy spirit was on him it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, verse 27, he entered the temple when the parents brought in the child Jesus to perform for him what was customary under the law. Simeon took him up in his arms. He praised God. He is holding the Messiah. He is holding Jesus Christ in his hands and he lifts him up Praise God. And he said, now, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Who's he talking to right now? He's speaking directly to this young child. He's looking at Jesus, this baby, holding him in his arms, and he's speaking to him, and he says, you, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised. For my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people, Israel. His father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then, then Simeon, he blessed them and he told his mother Mary, indeed, this child is destined. He's destined to cause the fall and the rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed and a sword will pierce your own soul that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. So we have three different prophetic looks here from Isaiah to Zechariah to, to Simeon. They're all looking to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the coming one. They're looking at him, either looking future or actually Zechariah is looking future. He's looking at his son who's going to prepare the way for Christ. And then Simeon, he gets to hold Jesus in his arms. He's holding him up and he's looking at him. You, master, can dismiss your servant because I've seen your salvation, he says. Such an amazing, amazing thing, though, that three different people in the Bible are recognizing Christ for who he is, the great light. And this is prophetic. This is profoundly prophetic because it had to happen and this had to be accomplished. It's not just some, you know, catchphrase that we use at Christmas time. 
This isn't some just, you know, Christian thing that you can say as a follower of Christ. You know, yes, of course, he's the light of the world. This had to happen. This is prophetic. Turn over to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4 in your Bibles. Let me show you how this ties into the Isaiah prophecy. Why this had to happen. And then we'll unpack this as we go through this message. Matthew chapter 4, starting verse 12, though. It says this, when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew from, uh, into Galilee. This is that region, that Zebulun and Nephtali region. He left Nazareth. He went to live in Capernaum by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Nephtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Nephtali, along the road by the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who live in darkness have seen a great light. And for those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. So this right here speaks to the fulfillment of this prophecy. And kind of this time for us to reflect, this is the prophecy fulfilled section of this sermon series and understanding as we move to Christmas, you can look back on Old Testament and even New Testament prophecies as they were fulfilled in the life of Christ and you can tie them in. So that's why Jesus spoke so quickly and so effectively and so consistently of the Old Testament. That's why he was always quoting scripture, because he was showing who he was. And he's also showing how prophecy would be fulfilled. And we know from last week, a word spoken by God prophetically is true because it's his spoken word. It will not return void. His word will remain forever. We know that, and Christ is showing in these moments where he's connecting the dots to the Old Testament. He's saying, this is who I am. He's saying, I am the Messiah. I am the great light. I am the one that has to go to this region, Capernaum, this land of the shadow of death. I have to be the great light. And then prophetically, if you even heard it from, from Simeon, he's saying not just for the Jewish people, not just for the Israelites, but for the Gentiles as well. And now us looking back on that, we can look back on that and rejoice at what he has accomplished. But I want to look at two different perspectives of the great light, of the light of Christ in our lives. I want to look at two different perspectives this morning. So first of all, I want to look at his light in us, and then I want to look at his light through us. His light in us and his light through us. Before his light can shine through us, his light has to shine in us, correct? We know that. That's pretty, pretty logical. So let's look at his light in us. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. We're going to go through a lot of scripture, and that's kind of, that's kind of the MO here at Renew Life Church. So if you're a first-time visitor, again, we say welcome. If you're a second or third or fourth-time visitor, you know you got to come in pretty stretched out and ready because we, we like to jump through scripture. We, we, we love God's word. I really love church. We love God's word. What we try to say, we want to get into God's word so that his word can get into us. We want to, we want to know more about God so that we can fall in love with God. And falling in love with him makes me want to obey God. So that's why his word is so central. We are grounded in the word of God. We speak God's word. We allow God's word to speak for itself. I could wow you with stories. I was a cop for 17 years. But what I love is God's word. And I want to allow his word to speak. So John chapter 1. His light in us. Jesus Christ first had to come. He had to come. So John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and all things were created through him. And apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life. And that life was the light of men, the light. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. We just read about John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light, the true light, 
that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was created through him, and yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be the children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of natural descent or of the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. Verse 14, the word became flesh. Jesus, the light, the great light, the light of men, became flesh. And he dwelt or tabernacled among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him and exclaimed, This was the one of whom I said, The one coming after me ranks ahead of me, because he existed before me. Indeed, we have all received grace upon grace from his fullness. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. No one has ever seen God. Listen to this, the one and only Son who is himself God and is at the Father's side. He has revealed him. In his coming, Christ recognized as the, as the light of the world, the light of mankind, the light that shines in the darkness. The darkness did not o- overcome it. This light came into this world to dwell among us, to tabernacle among us. He had to come. And what he did in his coming, he revealed the Father. And he says in other places, he teaches his disciples, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And in coming and becoming this great light and understanding he is fully God, fully man. Listen, he was in the beginning with God. The Word, Jesus, the great light, was God. He was with him in the beginning. All things were created through him and apart from him. Not one thing was created that has been created. So we look at the eternal characteristic of who Christ is, the great light, always be, always was. My grammar is horrible, but you know what I mean. He had to come. He had to dwell among us. He had to reveal who he was. That's the beginning of this. Flip over to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse number 12. He came and he revealed the Father. He's the light. He came in this world. He dwelt among us. He tabernacled among us. But then he also, he also identified himself as the light. As he worked through his ministry, as he worked through his earthly ministry, he identified himself as the light. He identified himself for who he was. And this was a big deal. It may not be a big deal for you and I as we look back on this, as we read Scripture, because we understand who Jesus Christ is. But this is a big deal to the Israelites who he's proclaiming this to. He's letting them know who he is, the Messiah. He's letting them know that he is taking the throne of David. He's letting them know that he was sent from God, and not only that, he was with God in the beginning. Not only that, he is God. So he was letting them know in this verse, chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus spoke to them again, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I am, he says, the light of the world. Jesus proclaimed and pro- professed right there in that moment who he was. And he's leading them to a place of understanding. Am I going to believe in his name? Or am I going to look for another Messiah? Which sadly, many are still stuck in that place. Flip over to First John. We do our own sword drill. First John chapter 1, verse number 5. So he came into the world, he's the light of men. He identified himself as the light of the world in John chapter 8, verse number 12. And right here, the apostle John is writing under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He's, he's reminding us of our fellowship with the light. He came into the world. 
He proclaimed and professed who he was, the great light. And then we are called to be in fellowship with him. So 1 John chapter 1, verse number 5, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. And there's absolutely no darkness in him. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and are not practicing the truth. If we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. This is the calling of Christ, the calling of God through the life of Jesus Christ. This is the command, the demand of God that we believe on the name of Jesus Christ. We're going to cover that here in a second. But I want you to recognize from this passage, he not only came as the light, he not only proclaimed and professed that he was the light of the world. He invites us to be in fellowship with him, to walk in the light, to walk in the light as he is in the light, as he is the light, rejecting darkness, coming to the light, coming to the truth. It says if we're in the light and we have fellowship with one another, and when I'm walking in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses me from all sin. This is the life of the Christ follower as we walk in the light. His light in us cleanses us from all sin. There's two responses from his light dawning in us. And this is really what I want to talk about this morning for the next several minutes. But I want to talk about the transform life. And then the renewed life. So understanding Jesus as the great light, okay, as we as we look at lights, as we look at Christmas trees, as we look at Christmas lights, we understand who the light is. The great light is the person, Jesus Christ. Now, as I understand his light in me, there has to be a response. The transformative life or the transformed life and a renewed life. I cannot be transformed by his light in me until I come to the place of accepting the gift that God has given us through his son. His light cannot begin to work in my life. My life cannot begin to be transformed unless I start at the place of salvation. It's got to be salvation. We have to start there. So John chapter 3 John chapter 3, we'll start in verse number 16. John 3, verse number 16, For God loved the world in this way. He gave His one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Anyone who believes in Him is not condemned. Did you catch that? Anyone who believes in Him... The great light, the light of the world, is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. This is the judgment, verse 19. Here it is. The light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and avoids it, so that his deeds may be or may not be exposed. But anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light, so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. This is the transformed life. The foundational piece of, of Christianity is Christ. This book, Scripture tells us, is, is it's. It's foolishness to those who don't believe. We can't expect to transform life without coming to faith and trust in Christ Jesus, without believing in his name for salvation, for forgiveness of sins. That's the starting place. That's where we start. In everything we do at Renewed Life Church, the gospel of Jesus Christ is proclaimed in everything that we do. That's because we understand that no matter what happens in this life, no matter what happens in my marriage, no matter what happens to my kids, no matter what happens to my job, no matter what happens in my elections, 
no, no matter what happens in this life, the transformed life must start with understanding who Jesus is, the great light. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through him. It is through Jesus Christ. He's the way. We want transformation. And we're, we're going to get to the renewed life. We want renewal of life. We want things to be new and fresh. We want things to be healed. We want things to be peaceful. We want things to be easy. But we have to understand. And as I look around the room, I believe that I see everybody in here, I believe, to the best of my understanding, has a relationship with Christ. But if somebody's here this morning who doesn't know who Jesus is, who's never said, you know what, I'm going to stop. I'm going to recognize who I am. A sinner condemned righteously and justly to live eternity separated from God. And I'm going to recognize in my sinful state, as I'm under the penalty of sin, that my only hope is to put my faith and trust in Christ, to believe, he says, in him. If you've never done that in your life, if you've never stopped and said, okay, God, I'm going to change my mind about who you are. And I'm going to confess with my mouth what you have done in raising up Christ from the dead. And I'm going to believe in his name for forgiveness of, sal for forgiveness of sins and salvation. If you've never done that, that's where the transformed life has to start. Because we can go to church, we can read our Bibles, and we can know a whole lot about God. A whole lot. But never experience salvation because we've never actually believed in his name. John chapter 12. Let me tie some things together here. John chapter 12, verse number 20. Now some Greeks were among those who went up to worship at the festival. So they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and requested of him, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Verse 22, Philip went and told Andrew. There's a chain of command in the disciples. Do you see that? I think that's cool. I don't know why. I think that's cool. So Philip goes to Andrew, and he brings this request. Hey, somebody wants to see Jesus. So both Andrew and Philip now, they go and they tell Jesus. Verse 23, Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies... It remains by itself, but if it dies, it produces much fruit. The one who loves this life will lose it, and the one who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me where I am. There my servant also will be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now my soul is troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this hour? But that's why I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. Others said an angel has spoken. Jesus responded in that moment. He says, this voice came not for me, but for you. Now is the judgment of this world. Here's the judgment. The light has come into the world. Here's the judgment. Now the rule of this world will be cast out. As for me, Jesus says, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate what kind of death he was about to die. Then the crowd replied to him, we have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who's the Son of Man? Jesus answered, the light will be with you only a little longer. Walk while you have the light so that darkness doesn't overtake you. 
The one who walks in darkness doesn't know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become children of light. Jesus said this, then went away and hid from them. If you skip down to verse 44, I don't think it's in our notes, but I want to point this out. Jesus cried out, the one who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And the one who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me would not remain in darkness. If, if anyone hears my words and doesn't keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and doesn't receive my sayings has this as his judge. The word I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a command to say everything I have said. I know that his command is eternal life. In 1 John chapter 3, it says the command of God is to believe in the name of Jesus Christ. The will of the Father is explained in Matthew chapter 7. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father. The command of God, the call of God, the will of God is to believe on the name of Jesus Christ. Believe in his name. We want transformed lives, like I've talked about. But we have to stop and recognize the hope is Christ. The mercy of God is Jesus Christ. The grace of God is Jesus Christ. The great light is Jesus Christ. The light of this world, the light of men, the only name given under heaven by which we must be saved is Jesus Christ. That Matthew 7 passage, talking about the will of the Father, many will say, Lord, Lord, we knew you. We, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We did all of these things. We knew you. We went to church. We knew about you. We read your word. We knew about you. But the response that Jesus will have in that moment, because of their failure to believe in the name of Jesus Christ, to recognize them as Messiah, as the Christ, the anointed one, the Holy One, Emmanuel, God with us, because of their failure to believe in his name, Jesus says in that moment, at the end of time, he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. And this sadly is a reality, folks. This is a reality of many people that we mix it up with, many people that we're in relationship with, many people who come into the church. They know plenty about God. They know plenty about his word. But they don't have a relationship with him through Jesus Christ. Because, as I've said, there's never been a time in their life when they stopped and they said, I will believe in Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins, for salvation. Transformed life will not happen without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And that only happens when we believe in the name of Jesus. So again, if you don't know Christ, I invite you today to give your life to Jesus. And maybe your thoughts are turning to somebody else. Just pour out in prayer over them. Pour out in prayer that God will allow you to share this message to testify about who Jesus is and the faith that you have in Christ, to share that with them. What we need to recognize, though, also as, as part of this transformed life is that, yes, it starts with salvation. Salvation is, is those who believe in Jesus. For those who don't believe, they're condemned already. 
So we understand that's a starting point. That's foundational, right, to being a Christ follower. We have to put our faith and trust in Christ. But sadly, many people put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. They trust him for eternal security. They trust him for, for salvation. They trust him, as I say often, for forgiveness of sins. But they do not live for Christ. Because what we fail to recognize in these passages is that Jesus Christ had some pretty radical requirements for following him. Pretty radical. We've kind of lost that over the years. We sell superficial nonsense, tips and tricks to become a better version of yourself. You do you. But what we fail to realize, what we fail to recognize is that the life lived for Jesus Christ is a crucified life. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. I no longer live. I'm done. But Christ lives in me. The, night, the, the, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 5.24, now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Part of a transformed life is, is becoming a child of God. When you call in the name of Jesus, he gives you the right to be a child of God. But then in following him, Jesus says, you want to follow me? Do you really want to follow me? And take up your cross daily. Take it up every day. And take your flesh and nail it to that cross. And Jesus says, follow me. Take up your cross every day and follow me. You want to save your life? You want to try to save your own life? You will lose it. You want to lose your life for him? That's when you save it. It's no longer I who live. It's Christ who lives in me. I give up. I give up rights to myself. Oswald Chambers says this, the natural life is not spiritual and it can only be made spiritual by sacrifice. If we do not resolutely sacrifice the natural, listen to this, the supernatural can never become natural in us. If we do not resolutely sacrifice the natural, the supernatural can never become natural in us. We want all these things. It's there's nothing wrong with this. I want peace. But beyond peace on this earth, I want the supernatural peace that passes all understanding. I want my marriage to be perfect. If my wife would just listen. <laughs> right? If my husband would just figure it out. Folks, it's not wrong to want these things. But what I really believe is happening over the last year and a half, two years, this entire world has been shaken up. And I've heard many guys stand up and try to apply some kind of prophetic and profound statement to this. And they may, may be right. But I'll tell you one thing that I know for sure that is happening, and it breaks my heart. And I'm going to tell you this, and you're going to recognize it, and I hope it breaks your heart. When COVID hit this world, we were all put in this cycle of weirdness, lockdowns, lockdowns lifted, restrictions imposed, all of these things. 
What I see as I look around the world, though, is a recognition of how deep our roots were in this world. You've got to admit it. Because a lot of the niceties, a lot of the conveniences, a lot of the things I've enjoyed were almost in a place of grieving over that. You talk to psychologists, you talk to people in this profession that know that, and they're saying people are actually grieving because we're in a place in this world that's not what it was. Two years ago, it was completely different. Two years ago, we can move around unrestricted. We don't have to worry about all this political nonsense. But I really believe even in the Christian faith, followers of Jesus Christ are grieving because they're recognizing how rooted they were in this world and how much their roots have been pulled up. And they're recognizing for the first time in their lives of followers of Jesus how radical this is. You want to follow me, he says? Take up your cross. Nail yourself to it every day. It's not about this world. We're meeting in a theater. It's wonderful. Movies play here, entertainment industry. It's prosperous in this place. But it's not about this world. What if my marriage fails? But it's not about this world. What if my kids turn from Christ and they rebel against me? And for years, like I did, they run in defiance. But it's not about this world. You want to see a transformed life? And I say this with every ounce of love in my heart. Recognize how much you're grieving for this world. How much you want to have the niceties and the conveniences and the enjoyment of all of these luxuries in this world. Recognize that all of that is being stripped away and we are seeing who we are in Christ. And none of us let me remind you, have suffered to the point of death on a cross. None of us have. You want to see a transformed life? Crucify yourself. Surrender to him every day. You wake up every single day. I will give up my natural flesh so that the supernatural can come in, so that God through his spirit can work in my life. Because then it doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter who's president. It doesn't matter who's governor. It doesn't matter who your husband is. It doesn't matter who your wife is. It doesn't matter who your kids are. It doesn't matter who your boss is. When I understand who I am in Christ, when I understand what he has done to free me from myself, and in followership of him, I'll do whatever you want. Here's my life. Take it. That's a transformed life. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The other aspect of the great light is his light through us. I'm sorry, let me back up a little bit because I do want to touch on this, the renewed life. Part of putting our natural selves to death every day, part of sacrificing and surrendering ourselves as living sacrifices to him we do recognize, as I've said many times, that in this world we, we face tribulation. Jesus says that. He says, don't fret, don't worry about that. And he reminds his, his disciples and he reminds us through his word that he's already overcome the world. But it doesn't mean these things, and, it, and that's why I want to be sensitive about this. It doesn't mean these things that we go through in this, in this life are not painful. I know what it's like to go through a horrible time in marriage. I know what it's like to be addicted to pornography, to be addicted to alcohol. I know what it's like to almost lose everything. I know what it's like to wish for death on myself. Rather than to continue in this life, I know what that's like. And I want to recognize in this moment, folks, that yes, we are going through a crazy weird time in this world and there is pain and there is suffering and there is persecution 
But because of the transformed lives that we live in Christ, we can live a renewed life. That's the essence of renewed life, church. We have a renewed life. And this isn't one time. That's what's cool about this. I can go, because of the mercies of God, boldly to his throne every day, and I can just pour myself out to him. Asking him to renew my life constantly. Because he'll renew it. And what do I do? I take it back, and I screw it up, and I booger it up, and I begin to focus on my circumstances, like Peter on the water. And I begin to sink And I have to go back and I have to abide in the vine, understand who I am as a branch. And I have to draw on the power of Jesus Christ through his spirit in my life. That's how I am renewed. Turn to Isaiah chapter 40 real quick, because I want to, I want you to catch this. If you get uh, emails from Renewed Life Church, and you get an email every week, and it's, it's kind of a little bit of a teaser of what will come in the sermon, uh, what will come in that we can gather. If you don't, like Peter said before the service, you can connect with us, send us an email. We, we will put you on that, that email chain so that your inbox can be even further inundated with emails, right? So, But I talked about in that email was, hey, this is a hope-filled message. So I do want you to, I, I, I want you to stop and recognize this. Isaiah chapter 40, starting in verse 28. Because that transformed life, and as we put our faith and trust in Christ, and he fills us with his spirit, we learn what it is to follow him, and we actually start to, I think, whittle away all of the superficial nonsense, we start to recognize what it is actually to radically follow Christ. If you want to follow me, take up your cross daily, nail yourself to it, and follow him. You want to save your life, you lose it. You want to lose your life for his sake, you will save it. That transformed life, that crucified life, I'm a living sacrifice for him. But I want you to recognize in the renewed life that we can go to him every day. Verse 28 says, do you know, or do you not know, Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the whole earth. He never becomes faint or weary. Did you hear that? He, our God, never becomes faint or weary. There's no limit to his understanding. He gives strength to the faint and he strengthens the powerless. Here's the hope-filled part of this, folks. If he is saying that he gives strength to the faint and he strengthens the powerless, that means we are the faint. Amen? We are the powerless. Anybody feeling that? Youths may become faint and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not become weary. They will walk and not faint. This, folks, is the renewed life. God is not saying that this life is going to be without weariness, without weaknesses, without pain, without grief without obstacles, without ups and downs. That's, he's recognizing that. And he's also telling us who he is, that he doesn't get tired. And he's a, he, he doesn't become weary. He doesn't faint. He doesn't give up. And what are we supposed to do? Verse 31, trust in the Lord. Those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. Running and not becoming weary, walking and not fainting. So we can live a transformed life through Christ, in Christ. It's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. I can allow him to live in me. I can sacrifice myself, surrendering everything to him. But then when I do hit those obstacles, when I hit those bumps and bruises in this life, when I recognize, ladies, my husband is not who he is or supposed to be, when this life becomes wearisome, when this life becomes tiring, I can trust in the Lord and he will renew my strength. That's awesome. 
That's what the great light does. So the other aspect of this is his light through us. And this is what I want to close with today. His light through us. Matthew chapter 5. Discipleship group should be able to quote this one. This is part of our memory verse for our D group. We are trying to learn the entire Sermon on the Mount by memory. And at some point, the fellows have agreed to stand up here and recite it. So, no? All right. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill can't be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, you, in the same way, us, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. So one response to the light working in us and then the light working through us, a response is simply evangelism. And no one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but on a lampstand. It gives light for all who are in the house in the same way. Let your light shine before others. Let your light shine. Why? So that they're attracted to you, see you, watch you? No. So that they give glory to your Father, to our Father who is in heaven. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, Paul reminds Timothy in this passage. He says, do the work of an evangelist. Do the work of an evangelist. He's telling Timothy, as you're planting churches, as you're raising up leadership in the church, you need to remember that you are to do the work of an evangelist. And that is not just for Timothy. That is for everyone. We are to do the work of an evangelist. And let me just remind you, if I am living a transformed life, which I am, if I'm saved by grace, through faith, in Christ, alone, by him, I didn't do anything for it. It's not, it's not my works. It's a gift of God. My life is, is forever changed and transformed. I'm indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And I surrender everything I am to him. I just say, I, it's, it's not me. I no longer live. I give up all my rights, Jesus. You live in me. And then as you shine your light through me, give me opportunities to spread your light, to share your name, to reflect your great light on others. That's the work of an evangelist. And we could end there, but I want to tangibly challenge you. Because if you haven't noticed, and I will say this often, when you look around at what is going on in our world, Christ is coming back very soon. So we are to go and make disciples of all nations. We are to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are to teach them to observe and obey everything that Christ taught us. And then he says, I'm going to be with you till the end of the age. I'll be with you. That age hasn't ended yet. So we are to do the work of an evangelist. How many of you wake up each day and ask God to put you in a position through your relational world, through those people that God has supernaturally and strategically placed in your life? How many people of you wake up every day and ask God, put me in a position to have a spiritual conversation with somebody. Put me in a position to speak your name. Put me in a position to tell them about my faith in you, Jesus. Put me in a position to tell them how you have transformed my life. That is a prayer that I promise you God will answer. I promise you. You need to wake up every day 
and begin to seek out opportunities through prayer that God would put you in, in relationships with people, that you can begin to invest in those relationships and that God will use you to shine in you and through you to bring his name to lost, sick, and dying people, broken, that need, they need hope, healing, and new life in Christ. So my challenge to you as we, as we leave, as we reflect on the great light, as we think about this and we let this saturate, I want you to think about the transformed life that you have been given. I want you to think about the opportunity to trust in the Lord. Put our trust in Him, and He will renew our lives. He will renew our strength. He will renew us every day. And I want you to think about, really saturate, how can I let the light of Christ, the great light, shine through me? There's five things real quick. I've said these before. Write them down. I want you to list the people in your relational world, the people that God has supernaturally and strategically placed in your life. I want you to begin to pray for them. I want you to look for opportunities to invest in those relationships. That's actually being in a relationship with them. I want you to begin to invite them, not just to Renew Life Church, but to invite them to come into your life and to see how you live and to see why your life is transformed. And I want you to prepare. Number five is prepare. Prepare by being in God's Word, by being in discipleship groups, by being in home groups, by being in relationships with other followers of Christ so that I can learn to share the message and the testimony of who Jesus is. Be prepared for those spiritual conversations. If I pray for God to put me in a position to have a spiritual conversation, I better be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within me. In season, out of season, I better be ready to profess and proclaim the gospel. You don't want to be the person that's not prepared. You don't want to be the person that someone comes to you and says, what is it about you? What's the hope that you have? You don't want to fumble in that moment. You want to be prepared to give an answer. You need to trust God for that. I have these coming it's your spiritual journey, a personal guide. Um, I ordered a whole bunch of these, but I've got a few. If you want to take one with you today, I want you to look at it. But basically, it gives you an opportunity to talk to somebody in those spiritual conversations and to say, hey, where are you at on this spiritual journey? You're either over here looking to the cross, or you're either on this side of the cross looking back in relationship with Christ. And, and it explains this really well, but it's an opportunity to, to hand this to somebody and say, hey, read this. Tell me where you're at on your spiritual journey. Well, I, I've never trusted in Christ. I've never committed my life to Christ. I've never believed in his name. And then you know where they are, and it leads you in the back on some verses, some Bible verses to be able to share Jesus Christ with somebody. So a great tool, a great technique, but this is a way to always be ready, to be prepared. So I've ordered a bunch of these because I really like it. I think it's something that, that's a great tool. It's very tangible. It's very easy. It's an easy conversation. And it kind of puts the ownership on the individual to say, okay, this is where I'm at. This is where I'm at. And then it gives you an opportunity to say, would you like to move from where you are to a place of putting your faith and trust in Christ. Or maybe you've put your faith and trust in Christ, but you're not living for Christ. Is it a time that maybe you need to get on your hands and knees and repent and confess and surrender? So this is a great tool. Uh, so again, list, pray, invest, invite, and prepare. Prepare for those spiritual conversations. Come on, worship team. Um, this is this something too is is it, 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 this is a great time 
for us to look again prophetically at these at these statements about who Christ is, the light of the world, the great light. But to pull from that, really, allowing his light to work in us, to transform us, to renew us, and then allowing his light to shine through us so that we can have opportunities to tell people about the love of Christ in our, that's in our life. So I really want you to think about that. And I want to give you an opportunity too. While we sing this last song, we're going to, we're going to begin to worship and we're going to begin to just pour out in song. Folks, if anything today has convicted you, if anything today has challenged you, I just want to assure you of something. It's not me. If you are convicted or challenged by what is being said through the Word of God today, it is the Holy Spirit that is working in you. And I want to give you an opportunity right now as we sing, as we pour out our hearts in, 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 in prayer and in, in praise and song to God, give you an opportunity to really just reflect on that and to begin to think through that and saturate in this and, and respond to God. We are not to be an unresponsive people. When God convicts us by his spirit, through his word, we are to respond. And we have choices in our response. We can reject what he's saying and say, no, not, 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 not right now. Or we can just surrender to him. So I just want to give you an opportunity for a few minutes as we sing this last closing song. Just to reflect on what God is doing in your life. It's the great light, the light of Christ is shining in your life. Do you know Jesus? More importantly, does he know you? Is your life being transformed by him? Do you need renewed life this morning? You need a reminder of the trust that we can put in him. Father God, thank you for an opportunity. Again, Lord, an opportunity just to stop and reflect on your word. God, thank you for Jesus, our Savior, your Son. Thank you that you, Jesus, are the great light that has shined in this world, that you are the light of men. And all we got to do is surrender to you, to believe in your name, and you will save us. You will give us the right to be called sons and daughters of God. Would you continue to work? Convict us, lead us, and guide us into all truth. And God, help us to be bold in our response. Father, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us?